right, it's party time. I'm here at one of the many shindigs going on around the country to celebrate the launch of the PlayStation 2 Computer Entertainment System. And to help kick things off, we decided to split up this issue of the magazine. Disc 1 will have all the usual cool stuff that you can play on your PlayStation, but Disc 2 is all DVD, baby. You know what that means. You'll need a PlayStation 2 to play the second disc. You're going to have to scour the countryside for one because these things are flying off the shelves. Not nice to gloat, Maggie. Just because you've got one already. And soon, so will everyone else. Okay, so on disc one, we headed up to Montreal to hang out with the developers of the new Grinch game. Then we partied on at some of the biggest PlayStation 2 launch celebrations. <laughs> Must have been a tough couple months for you. Hey now, I can only deal with one Grinch per disc. Yeah, very funny. So, uh, do you want to check out our first PlayStation 2 DVD disc? Well, it's about time. See you on disc two. I have a great idea. This year, the Who's will pay. It's beginning to look a lot like holiday time. We thought you'd like a special treat, a story all in rhyme. Today, we'll give you a backstage look, an update of that classic book. You've heard about the movie new. Now, The Grinch is a video game, too. Universal uh, approached us in summer 99 uh, uh, with concept The Grinch which was a video game based on a movie to be released uh, in uh, November uh, 2000. But I think The Grinch is a great character because it allowed us to reverse the perspective that a gamer has usually, which is be a good guy. In The Grinch, you are a bad guy that, that can't stand love. We tried as much as we could to uh, mimic what Jim Carrey would do in the movie. And so basically what we did is we brought that back and then we used that as a reference for the animation for The Grinch. It would seem to be a cinch that all would know about The Grinch. Alas, it is not true. They were French-Canadian and hadn't a clue. At first it was like, who is The Grinch? I didn't really know. So we got the uh, actual cartoon that was made and through the internet, you know, looking at references, books. These were really the references we had for the Grinch. And if I knew him before, he would be probably one of my idols because the Grinch, he's so funny. Everybody has a little bit of the Grinch inside. Grinch's mission was most foul. When he heard those who's, oh, how he'd howl. So as the tale goes, he set out to see if he might steal Christmas away that same Christmas night. I'd say the game uh, departs from the movie as soon as we get out of Whoville. What we've done is we've created environments that didn't exist in the story. As soon as you get out of Whoville, you go to Who Forest, Who Lake, you go to the dump, In order to keep joy from the Who's, the Grinch stops at nothing to make certain they lose. What kind of tricks and what kind of toys will this Grinch use to scare Who girls and Who boys? What we really wanted were the gadgets in the game. We wanted to give the player the feeling that they were actually building them. So what we did is we scattered blueprints of the gadgets throughout the levels. And the player can't just use a gadget, you know? It's not like it, the, the gadget is just floating around. You have to find the blueprints, go back to your computer machine in the Grinch cave, which is where everything is starting, and then build up the gadget uh, just much like a puzzle, I'd say. You're just moving the pieces together until you fit them in place, and then the gadget is activated. I'd say for me, uh, one of the best, I think, is the uh, rotten egg uh, shooter. I think, I mean, just the idea of shooting rotten eggs, I thought were pretty funny. So, green egg, I should say, but, you know, the green egg launcher, I thought, I thought was an interesting weapon to use, you know, just throwing eggs in, you know, people's window and 
see them, you know, running because it smells so bad. I thought it was pretty interesting. The Grinch is really fiendishly crude. He likes to be rotten, nasty, and rude. But can this new game hope to cause such fear? The answer is quite devilishly clear. The Who's will cringe and quiver and hide as the gamers give in to their Grinchier side. Time for a facelift, Mr. Mayor. The interesting thing about the tricks in the Grinch was that we needed to use the tricks and put that in a video game format. So we had to think about tricks that could be played and you know with a controller. The funniest tricks are those against the mayor. Let's say you have like uh, the mayor's posters scattered across Whoville for instance and then you would have to paint a mustache or change him <laughs> to a clown. Yeah, Grinch! The Grinch does love to tease and to taunt, but now we must know more about this game that we want. Is it easy to play? Is it done in a day? What do you say? What do you say? You really don't look healthy. The game is constructed in a way that an inexperienced gamer can easily go through the game, have fun, and finish it, and see the ending. But also, to complete the game 100% takes a lot of dedication. I'd say one of the most challenging puzzles is what we call the clock tower. In the movie, you have a tower uh, which shows, displays that uh, the day is left before Christmas. The idea is basically to change the days that are left just to make people free. We now bid adieu to our inventive team. Our excitement can barely stay in at the seam. To you gamers we wish with all of our might. Happy holidays to all and to all a Grinchy night. Welcome to another exciting edition of Cool Moves. This week we'll look into Spyro, Year of the Dragon. I'm going to show you how to get on top of the temple in Frozen Altars. Make your way from the beginning of the level, up this staircase, and around this corner, where you'll come to a ledge you can glide from. From here you can glide onto the temple. So just line yourself up on this corner, with the corner of the temple in view, then charge over the edge, jump, glide, and flutter at the end to get on top of the temple wall. From here, you can make your way to the top of the temple, or you can glide to another egg. And that's how it's done. Here's a cool move for the level Farcom Expo Center in the game Siphon Filter 2. Now the troubling part is getting through the ventilation shaft immediately following the second checkpoint without alerting the guards nearby. I'm going to show you how it's done. Starting here immediately after you acquire your second checkpoint, you want to climb up into the ventilation shaft and then follow it as it winds around the many different corners. What we're looking for here is the three ventilation grates. What we want to concentrate on is the uh, second or the middle ventilation grate. That's where we'll get a clear view of the GI. Once again, not this ventilation grate, that's the first one, but the second one, which is right here. First thing we need to do is go ahead and shoot out the ventilation grate with our pistol. Okay, then you see a GI right down there. Now we need to go in and equip our crossbow because it uses tranquilizer darts. It's very important that we do not kill the GI because that will fail the mission. We do not want to shoot the GI in the head because that will also uh, kill the guard, which once again we do not want to do. Shoot him anywhere else on the body with your crossbow. That'll take him out, and you want to continue down through the ventilation shaft until you reach the final grating. Switch back to your 9mm pistol, shoot that out, and then drop down to the floor below. And that's how you get through the ventilation shaft without alerting all the GIs. Here's a cool move to get off the rooftop in the New York slums level for Siphon Filter 2. What you want to do here is come up onto this fan, 
make sure you select a powerful weapon with enough uh, ammo. You have a couple of guards up here that you're going to want to take out. Go ahead and take them easily out with headshots. Have one there on, on the level of the rooftop that you're on and the one below. Pick up any flak jackets and ammo that they have. Then come over here to this ledge on top of the roof. Turn around and drop down below. And use your L1 button to see an awning down below that says clean rooms, low rates. Drop down to that area there. And this will get you down into street area in the New York slums level, so you can go ahead and continue on. And that's how it's done. This cool move is for Legend of Dragoon. I'm going to show you how to open the locked chest in the Phantom Ship. Here we go. In the Phantom Ship, there is a chest that says uh, evil may come to the person who attempts to open the treasure chest. There's a combination lock on this chest to get the combination. Leave the room where the treasure chest is. Go down to the lower right hand corner of the screen and then make your way over to the staircase that leads down to the lower deck of the ship. In the lower deck of the ship, you'll find a hallway filled with ghosts and several doorways you can enter. You must fight your way through the ghosts in the hallway to get to the door all the way in the far right hand side of the hallway. Once you get into the room at the end of the hall, make your way into the upper right hand corner of the room where there's a small sparkling bit on the floor. Press the X button to inspect this and you'll be visited by four ghosts. Each ghost will tell you a different number. Take note of these numbers. For three of these four numbers are the solution to the combination. Now that you're equipped with the clues that'll help you solve the combination lock, make your way back through the hallway to the upper deck of the ship. The first time you attempt to open this chest, you'll get 10 tries. If you're unsuccessful in choosing the combination within 10 tries, the chest will lock up on you, and you'll have to go get new clues from the ghosts in the lower deck. Using the numbers that the ghosts in the lower deck of the ship told you, rearrange the numbers until you find the correct combination. Whenever you input the incorrect combination, you might see three dots appear on screen afterwards. This indicates that one or more of the numbers you chose was the correct number and was in the correct position for the combination. This will help you know you're on the right track when you're trying to figure out the combination. And that's how to open the combination chest inside the Phantom Ship on Legend of Dragoon. You can repeat this up to six times, but each time you do, the chest will reset, which means you'll have to go below decks and get new clues from the ghosts. You'll also get fewer and fewer times to input the numbers before the combination resets each time. Good luck! In this segment of Cool Moves, I'm going to show you how to get past the Norse God Puzzle in the Spiral Tower for Wild Arms 2. Let me show you how it's done. First of all, when you come to this room, you'll notice that there are seven plates. You must hit these seven plates in a certain order in order to open up the door to the next room. The first plate that you want to activate will be this one right here, the one that talks about the mother's face. The second plate you want to hit will be this one over here. The one that talks about two. The third plate you want to hit is going to be this one. Here's where you're going to want to press the fourth plate. Here's the fifth plate. The sixth plate. And lastly, the seventh plate. And as you can see, that will open up the door. And that's how it's done. PlayStation 2, it's on everyone's mind these days, and leading us into its North American launch, the excitement and anticipation surrounding it is starting to blow a few minds. Man, the graphics, the graphics is outstanding out here, I'm loving it. 
The graphics are sweet, especially on that fighting one down there. The controllability of the games are unbelievable. I mean, it's very smooth. It's smooth, it's fast, and it makes for a more real-life playing experience. It's pretty, uh, pretty close to cinematic quality. It's, it's unbelievable. There were a lot of parties being planned to celebrate the arrival of the PlayStation 2. Since we've never been known to miss out on free food and drink, we flew down to LA for what turned out to be a rather raucous rave. Oh man, this is beautiful. As you can see here, we got the hundreds of kids having fun playing PlayStation 2, dancing in the unison of you know the music. This is, I think, what you know the urban culture. They play video games. They listen to uh, music. They they go to raves. All the kids here, they play video games. You know. And you go to a rave, you play a video game, you go play a video game, you dance when you win. Same difference, you know? It's all good. Dancing and video games. What better life is that? This was definitely a rave to remember. Some people were dancing up a storm out on the floor. And some were creating another type of storm playing video games. We were interested in what their favorite games were. Ready to rumble too. Shaquille O'Neal with that reach, baby. Hustle him up. I got to beat up Michael Jackson. I feel good now. You know what I'm saying? I got to beat up Michael Jackson. Tekken is my favorite game. It's really in intricate fighting, and it's, the styles of the fighting is just great, you know? It's I think Ridge Racer 5 looks great. Finally realized as it should be. Um, Vanavision's actually really good too, which I, I'm kind of glad they did something to show off the power. Great demonstration of its lighting and particle effects. I like the football one over there in the in the bar area, the 21 and up area. The football one has nice graphics. You got the people on the sideline chilling. You see them drinking their Gatorade while they're playing, and that's, I mean, how can you get any realer? The following week, we were off to the Metreon in San Francisco. That's where Sony Computer Entertainment was celebrating in style. Of course, when it came to having an opinion on which games were the best, these folks needed no prompting. The favorite thing, obviously, has been Madden 2001. It's just been great. I mean, everything from the realism of the rain scene, I think it's totally cool. And then I love watching, you know, the fact that they're breathing in the rain through the field. So, and then not only do you get to play football, but you get to actually feel like you're there. Uh, the Tech and Tag uh, tournament is pretty, uh, pretty unbelievable. Well, my favorite game was SSX, snowboarding game. Um, I thought the visual effects were really great. The graphics was awesome. Carmen, Sony Just remember this. Before you could say honey roasted peanuts, we were back on another plane headed for LA. With no invitation in sight, we made a feeble attempt to crash a star-studded Hollywood party. Luckily, we knew someone on the guest list who was able to sneak us in. Now, we may have been starstruck, but Maggie did manage to strike up some conversations. I'm a huge PlayStation fan. I I've been waiting for this day. I'm going to cry right now. I, I think I'm going to cry. I'm a huge fan. Oh, I'm having a blast. I mean, there's, there's music, food and PlayStation, it's pretty much a guy's heaven. I think I can pretty much quit, quit my TV show and just sit up here on the roof and play. Maggie, the epitome of the inquiring mind, just had to know if Wayne was going to subscribe to the PlayStation Underground. Now that I know the PlayStation Underground is around, I'll be there. I'll definitely be there. Um, can, I, can I get codes and tips and whatnot? Oh yeah. Then I'll do it. Because when I can't beat it, I just cheat. It's sad but true. Even though we were wiped out from our trips, we were brimming with confidence that the PlayStation 2 launch would be a huge success. Why? Because of the word on the street. Um, actually, I already got one reserved for the day it comes out. Uh, most definitely. I already have mine pre-ordered. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the 26th, I'll be either camping or I'll be knocking doors to get one. I thought it would be like a perfect birthday present for me because today's my birthday. And I'm definitely going to go buy me one right when it comes out. It's on my Christmas list. I'm hoping to get two. I can't wait for them to come out. I'm gonna get like six of them. Wow, that was so cool. Check out the architecture. This thing is awesome. That's our new interface control system, completely redesigned for the PlayStation 2. Extremely cool. I love the new Neo Tech look. Yeah, Maggie, uh, why don't you tell the viewers what we have in store for them? Alrighty then, the team from Tecmo dropped by to give us a taste of their new DOA 2 Hardcore game. Oh, and Maggie, don't forget about our trip up to LucasArts to check out the new Starfighter game. Okay, who's the host here, you or me? Sorry. We also have cool moves, downloads, and all the other stuff you've come to expect from the PlayStation Underground, so check it out!
Okay, I'm gonna float around here a while checking out all the new PlayStation 2 stuff. See you on the inside! The winner and still champion of the world! In a world of champions, only one shall prevail. Now, the greatest boxers of all time will compete once again.
Ready? From the producers of the Japanese PlayStation 2 game Dead or Alive 2 comes the all-new, all-American version DOA 2 Hardcore. It's got fearless fighters, way cool control, and scads of incredible women. Hey, keep your pants on, fellas, because it's time to hear from the game director, Tom Itagaki, on what makes this fighting game so sweet. There are three things that make a fighting game great. First of all, we focus on the motion of the game. Secondly, we work on the playability or control. And thirdly, we think about what will feel the best when we play. The visual and sound are secondary. It doesn't matter how good it looks or how good it sounds if you don't have those three things. Motion, control, and the good feeling. What I mean by motion is that it is not just the attacks, but is the entire movement of the character, from standing position to fighting. The stance of the character is quite important. No matter how good of an attack this particular character might have, if his stance does not look cool, you aren't getting the full benefit of the motion. Of course, the standing is one thing, but the attacks do need to look good. And when you get hit, you need to look like you're in pain. That relates to the good feeling that you get as a player. Okay, besides the motion, the control, and that I love it when my face is bashed in feeling, we needed to know what separates DOA 2 Hardcore from the other fighting games. The controls of the game are based on the Japanese game Jenkin or Rock, Paper, Scissors. In the past, fighting games have only had two types of moves, offensive and defensive. So I added the third component, the hold button. The concept of Jenkin is so simple. It is something that everyone can relate to. That is why when we apply it to a fighting game, it works. The typical block feature of other games are low risk, low return. Our hold button allows you to do high risk, high return. Also, we do have a regular block mode as well. Speaking of blocks, DOA 2 Hardcore features a bunch of blockbuster new levels. The question is, what inspired these new levels? And did those amazing women have anything to do with it? We created three new levels for this game. Crimson is based on the city of Hong Kong. I designed the desert scene from the Great Plains of America. And in the dojo, I wanted to introduce Japanese culture to Americans. Whenever I come to America, I am impressed by it and touched by it. When American gamers play the dojo level, I want them to feel the same thing to be impressed by it and touched by it. So I included subtle details like a shiny wooden floor and the paper partition door that you can knock out if you want to. These things are very Japanese, and I'm hoping that gamers will get a feel for the culture. There are also two other new levels, but you'll have to wait and see them for yourself. Delayed gratification is so 90s, but it looks like we don't have a choice. What we do have a choice is asking another question, and that is, what else can our gung-ho gamers expect? DOA 2 Hardcore is not just a fighting game. I look at it as a fighting action game. So if you keep playing the game and punch a wall or break a door, it may show you things that will surprise you. Let's go! One thing that was no surprise to us was the incredible animation. We wanted to know how they were able to capture such realism, so we went to the source, lead animator Hiroaki Matsui, who explains how he got his dojo, uh, mojo, working. Basically, we start off with a hand drawing of the character. That is always the basis. And then in order to capture some live feel, we use motion capture. After that, we go back to the hand drawing. We enhance the motion capture images. We take a video of the motion capture to aid in touching up the motion capture by hand. This is power, Lei Fang! 
There's something about DOA 2 Hardcore that makes the game feel very much like a movie. You don't know anything about power. <laughs> and it's not just the gratuitous violence, ear-piercing sound effects, and female fighters. We looked at Itagaki-san to shed some light on the subject. In the past, fighting games often had a cinema mode that tells the backstory. During the game, you switch back and forth from cinema to game mode. Because the quality between the two modes was very different, it tended to break the flow. What we tried to do with DOA 2 is to have a seamless transition from cinema to the gameplay. I believe that is what gives you the movie-like experience. This is why we need to use the DVD platform of the PlayStation 2. DOA 2 Hardcore is not only a bone-breaking game, but a groundbreaking game as well. In short, we love it. But will there be more games like it? We asked director Tom Itagaki to tell us what's up for the future. I am in the midst of figuring that out myself, and I'm talking to a lot of people and giving it deep thought. Right now, my game is the future. Star Wars movies as we are, you've probably daydreamed once or twice about being part of an epic space battle. Well, thanks to the team at LucasArts, that daydream is now virtually a reality. They've created Starfighter, the flight combat game that lets you star as the pilot of your very own Starfighter from Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. But don't forget to strap yourself in, Starfighter is being powered by the PlayStation 2 and an incredible storyline. Just a blockade, there's a full-scale invasion going on. We start off a little bit before Episode 1, Phantom Menace starts and um, we kind of follow a parallel storyline that's behind the scenes, kind of. The story is about three characters, Rees, N Vanna, and Nim. Um, these are three characters who don't know each other. Rees is a Nebu fighter pilot who's training. Um, Nim is a pirate, and Vanna is a mercenary out for hire. And these are characters who, if they know each other, it's only loosely, and in fact, Nim and Vanna are kind of semi-enemies. I think you can flank the Vanna Sage. Yeah. And each of these three characters has been uh, wronged in some way or has uh, been screwed over by the Trade Federation. Midway through the Starfighter game, after you've learned exactly what the Trade Federation has done to tick these guys off, uh, the three characters, Vanna, Rees, and Nim, come together and uh, in concert work to uh, deal a little bit back to the Trade Federation. What makes a video game great, besides awesome visuals, are fascinating characters and well-thought-out storylines. Starfighter not only has both, but it goes one step further and intertwines the stories of these three main characters. We're approaching a training minefield. They'll give you a chance to familiarize yourself with your targeting system. And you follow this one pilot, Reese Dallos, kind of through his training, and then his royal escort, and then he kind of gets split off from the events of the movie onto his own storyline. And I think at that point the player is sort of wondering what are these three characters and what do they have to do with each other? And that's one of the things that we tell through the structure of the game is as a play they start to go, oh, okay, now I see how these two characters are related and I see how they're going to come together and they're going to work together um, towards the ultimate goals. Well, Nim, my know-it-all co-pilot just taking out the landing platform first. The player starts out playing a number of missions from each character in turn and then when the characters join forces we start just beating them you know, right and left with new characters and play this character and you go back to this character and that allows us to tell the story from a bunch of different points of view. The LucasArts team is no stranger to designing ships for space and most of the ones in Starfighter are based on designs from the movie. The challenge they had to come up with was a vehicle for Nim and the other pirates. We needed to come up with a whole new line of vehicles that were around the pirates. They, we wanted them to have a very distinctive look, a cohesive look. And what we came up with is something that looks like 60s hot rods, you know, with cool paint jobs, and, but then there's, you know, Bondo on the side, you know, and, and there's big giant engines on them. They really are like painting your own car, you know, big flames on the side. Uh, they all have their unique look for the character, all kind of metal and 
and over the top, and they, you can tell that they all, it looks like they all painted their own vehicle. As in any flight combat game, control is critical, and no one knows that better than this creative team. With Starfighter, their mission was to find a way to help those who might find themselves flying upside down, or worse. We wanted a game that allowed the player to fly around in any dimension, so if they want to fly up and do a loop or flip over upside down, we wanted to give them complete freedom in the environment. Um, but one of the challenges that creates for some players is they'll get upside down and it's difficult for them to get flipped back around. For Starfighter, we realized we couldn't restrict the player without frustrating the player, but at the same time we wanted to give them the uh, ability to get themselves righted really quickly. So we added some buttons. When you actually push down on the analog controllers and right yourself, you can right yourself with roll and you right yourself in pitch and so you can get yourself squared up to the train and, and flying forward. Starfighter is the first PlayStation 2 game from LucasArts. We were interested in knowing what it was like to work with this powerful platform. We were able to throw just enormous amounts of texture and geometry at the screen. I mean, you look out in these environments that just seem to go on forever. That's just the raw power of the PlayStation. Working with PlayStation 2 was, you don't know the boundaries. I didn't know how far to push it. I'm used to doing like Nintendo games and PlayStation games, and there's those barriers that everybody realizes. So I just kind of keep pushing until the programmers tell me to stop. And the philosophy on the Starfighter team is essentially this. The programming team is at the service of the art and level design team. I, I like to think of it as, you know, we, we build picture frames. Ultimately, the art team and the level design team makes the picture, and that's the important thing. How about this size texture? What about this geometry count? Um, can we have particle systems, and what kind of effects can we have? And, and it almost seemed limitless. In the past, you really had to worry about the number of particles you had in a particle system. Uh, these days, I mean, you can put a lot of particles up there uh, and not really worry too much about slowing the game down. In fact, that's kind of a danger, of course. I mean, you want to make sure that you're not just saying, oh, well, I can draw a million particles, why don't I? I mean, it all has to be in service of the gameplay, and it all has to be done in a context that it, that it makes sense. And so what that really implies is we need to do everything we can to take all this tremendous power that we've got with the PlayStation 2 and put it into the hands of the artists, put it into the hands of the level designers, expose that stuff um, in a generic and flexible way. And, you know, we suspected that if we did that well, we'd be surprised. And, uh, were we ever. Man all defenses, prep the transport for evac. Hustle! Affirmative. Hostiles approaching from orbit. We've got Nandos, 12 o'clock high. We have a pirate base mission, Janim Pirate Base, which is inside of a double impact crater. And this base is kind of you know, snugged up against the walls, and you have ships down there in, dock, in docking facilities. And uh, the Trade Federation comes in, and they are trying to get back some stolen technology, and they raid Nim's base in the middle of the night. And in just comes massive amounts of Trade Federation forces. Uh, it's very clear very quickly that, of course, the pirate base is not going to survive, and at that point it becomes uh, an extremely hectic, frantic scramble to get people out of that base as quickly as possible. It's dark, you see lit up buildings, you see you know, lights, all of a sudden the turrets start going crazy and things are coming in from space and it's black up there and all you see is shadows of big landers coming down, they're kind of blocking out the stars and you see tracers going across the sky. I mean, it just, it looks like a war zone and you've got people yelling and screaming. I think this, the whole experience is extremely immersive for me. Scratch that, sir. Got him on my sensors. Help him out. Liam, I'm sending you the target. Get this guy. On November 17th, have the best Christmas ever! Open your eyes to a world unlike anything you've seen before. It was too great! <laughs> From director Ron Howard, Dr. Seuss's classic tale comes to life. Jim Carrey is the Grinch. <laughs> Rated PG. 
This cool move is for Fanavision for the PlayStation 2 game console. What I'm about to show you is in multiplayer mode, how you can use the power-up to not only detonate the flares that are on your side of the screen, but also obtain the flares that have yet to be detonated on player 2's side of the screen. In the upper right hand corner, you'll see a circular icon. What you want to do is capture this icon in conjunction with two similar colored flares. Once you detonate this uh, combination, it'll initiate a sequence which switches the screen, not only detonating the flares which are on your side of the screen, but also giving you the flares that are on player two side of the screen, putting you at an advantage. And this is a cool move for Fanavision. Have fun with it. What I'm about to show you is some basic gameplay techniques for Fanavision for the PlayStation 2 game console. I'll show you them. Uh, basically what you want to do in this game is capture at least three consecutive flares in order to get a detonation. Uh, when you catch these three consecutive flares, what they need to be is all the same color. So right now I have all blues. Uh, during the game, what you want to do, even though it sometimes gets a little frantic, what you want to do is just pace yourself and try to get as, at a minimum of three explosions at a time. That way it gives you time to think about what's coming up next and setting off your next explosion. So right here I have three oranges. Set them all off. If you don't get a, if you don't have uh, three consecutive ones like I have right now, it's always safe to just capture and then release them. This is a technique called dribbling. What this allows you to do is keep the flares on screen longer. That way you can create more complex combinations with different colors and make it a more spectacular fireworks display. With these multi flares, the uh, flares with the little uh, dots around them, this green one right here, if you capture one of those and detonate it, it releases into smaller flares. What you can do then is hit the circle button yet again and detonate them, giving you more time to set up your next explosion. These are just some basic gameplay techniques that'll help you get through the game and hopefully get through hard mode. Hope you use them well. The cool move I'm going to show you is for the game Madden 2001 for the PlayStation 2. And it's a technique I call the Madden Misdirection Run. And here's how you do it. First of all, pick a good running play. I usually like to choose a halfback toss or sweep. That's going to allow my running back to run far and wide to the outside. When you see the defender coming at you, draw him in one direction. In the last second, cut back the other way down the sideline for a big game. The defense has a hard time with any sudden moves in direction. You do this move over and over again, you'll get at least 300 to 400 yards per game. I'm going to show you a cool move for the new snowboarding game for the PlayStation 2 called SSX. These are shortcuts that you can find throughout the tracks that will shave time off your score as well as unlock new tracks for you. As you're traveling down the track, you'll notice glass signs on the side that say SSX. Head for those and break through. Some are easy to get and some are a lot more challenging. As you can see here, I'm not on the regular track. These shortcuts will save you a lot of time. You'll find three or four of these shortcuts per course. So whenever you see the SSX sign, aim for it, bust through it, and shave time off your record, earn gold medals, and new tracks.
Thank <laughs> you.